Hi everybody, I'm Steve here with Dr. Nario. Dr. Nario, as you know, is with Biointegrative Health Center in Reno, Nevada. Thanks for being with us, doctor. Hi, Steve. Thank you for having me again. Always a pleasure. All right, so we're really excited. We're going to talk about my blood work, and we've been working on this for a number of years. But first, I just want to say, you know, I give you authority and permission to speak about my blood work as, as we go through it. So um, I'm just giving you that permission. Um, and that way you can speak about it. Um, so um, let's first talk, you know, um, I'm 61 years old. And um, I've been going to the clinic for over six years now and getting different treatments and stuff. And my diet is excellent for me. You know, you guys hear me say all the time, everyone's different. You got to find the right combination for you, whether it's uh, vegan, vegetarian, carnivore, or somewhere in between. That's what I believe. I know for me, I'm kind of low carb. I'm uh, under 50 net carbs every, every day, pretty much. But we want to talk about my blood work. And this is just like what you've been doing with me for the last six plus years when we see my blood work and you go through it with me and we tweak a few things and, you know, you may recommend a few supplements or so on. So um, I'm 61 years old and I'm very proud of my blood work. I mean, is it perfect? No, because as we went through this in detail the first time, you know, you'd slide something over a little bit or, and it's, you know, it might be right in the middle, but you were kind of comparing it to what it was before and what it was four years ago. So you guys got to all keep that in mind too. I might be right in the middle of the range, but you know, the doctor might want that to go this way a little or that way a little because he knows me and he knows what it was before the year before and the year before and wants to make sure he keeps those trends going in the right direction. So um, the first thing um, you said was my my blood work is really good, right? For a 61 year old. That is correct, Steve. Well, you have to remember the audience. This is kind of like a reality show uh, tribute. We're actually real time analyzing Steve's blood test and uh, sharing it out there for everyone to benefit from. And then number two, you have to remember, Steve is one of our role model patients, and he's one of the better ones out there to 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 actually uh, have benefited from integrative therapies. So let me let me kind of classify Steve in a in a different way here. When I say that when I see sixty year olds at at his age there are comorbidities away that I see. And Steve, again, hits the mark on these checklists. For example, a lot of 61-year-olds that I see would have cardiovascular diseases, such as hypertension. Again, Steve doesn't meet that requirement. Metabolic and endocrine issues, type 2 diabetes, um, uh, issues with, with uh, fat mass, uh, muscle ratio. A lot of these patients, they would already have this at this stage. But Steve, again, not even there. Uh, aches, pains, musculoskeletal symptoms. Uh, even though he is an exerciser, he's definitely doing the right things to repair his body. A lot of cancer issues, again, in these age groups. When we check the PSAs, colonoscopies, uh, when we do his blood work, again, this is a pretty clean slate for him. Uh, brain issues, forgetfulness, a lot of this. You know he's running a business. He has all of these videos. You know he's all intact up there. Sleep problems, huh? like sleep. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about that later. But respiratory issues like sleep apnea, so snoozing and snoring while I'm sleeping and you stop breathing. So these issues you would notice when there's fatigue when you wake up in the morning. Obviously not him. He's doing cartwheels when he wakes up. GI issues, reflux, uh, bloating, constipation. Again, zero on that part. Um, uh, urological conditions like frequent urination, uh, prostate cancer, so far so good on that end. Immune system, always getting sick. But uh, for this guy, as you can see, he's always active and doing it. And of course, mental health. There's a lot of people who are depressed, anxious at this level. 
because of course, not only through the physical condition, but also the things that happen in their life. Again, Steve, clean slate. See how perfect of a role model patient that he is. I'm trying. So, <laughs> um, so now the first thing that we started working on that I really focused on, well, let's talk a little bit about the liver enzymes because mine were high. Right. And I've got things dialed in for me to clean up those liver enzymes. And I think it was like maybe three, four years ago, I actually had a scan and found that I did have fatty liver. Now everything seems to be dialed in and really working well. So let me ask you about, um, I'm going to ask you about uh, two, the AST. Um, that was 36 on my previous blood work. It's 38 now. The range is we want to be under 40. Now, lower would be better, but mine came from 100. Um, so my AST, 38, and my ALT, 34. What would you say about that? Well, Steve, with, with the, as you can see with your liver, I mean, um, there's probably a more of a story that you can tell about that. We've been, when we were dealing with this like three, four years ago, you were like double, triple um, high. That's why we prompted ourselves to investigate a little bit more using an ultrasound. Thus, we saw the fatty liver, right? Um, and again, we ruled out cancer. We ruled out um, hepatitis and all of these proper things. Uh, but one thing that you probably didn't uh, mention was the supplements that you were taking during those times. And that's why when you trim down those supplements, and Steve can tell you it's a bucket load of stuff, when you trim that down, it actually helped lower down that liver enzyme back to normal. And going th thus to this discussion of dietary supplementation, there are so many things that our people out there needs to know about, um, like, for example, the quality. Some, some, some supplements are actually sometimes harmful because they have metals, toxins, and impurities. And even when people does not follow the recommended dosing, and the liver always takes this in terms of metabolizing all these supplements. So fat soluble, especially ADEK, uh, actually gets absorbed more by fat and liver actually has a lot of tissues that stores this. A lot of herbal supplements out there. They actually sometimes unadulterated. Some comes from China. We don't know where, how, where it came from, how it was processed, and even unregulated ingredients. So in this situation, who knows if it was Steve's um, diet or lifestyle that he changed. But I think the biggest benchmark that moved the needle for him was when he changed his um, supplement habits. And when it went down, I mean, in terms of the count, the liver enzymes also calmed down. And that's why lesson here, and Steve knows about this, get it from reputable brands, follow dosages, and be cautious about herbs that we don't know about, and make sure you purchase supplements through so, uh, trusted sources. Yeah, um, that, that's a great point. The, <clears throat> I was taking a lot of synthetic vitamins and minerals. Now, like I was taking a lot of synthetic vitamin C, a lot of synthetic um, B complex, a lot of that. Now I still take those things, but now I get them from whole food sources. If you guys have questions, just put them in the comment and I can tell you what I use if you want to know, but, um, whole foods. So my vitamin C is not azorbic acid anymore. It comes from whole foods, a whole food type supplements. And so all my vitamins and minerals are coming from whole foods. They're in a supplement form, but they're made from whole foods. And <clears throat> that's one thing that made a difference. Also, I do um, every three weeks, I'm at the clinic and I do um, a plaque X treatment, which is um, a liver detox, right, doctor? Yep. And I also do... Um, glutathione. So I'm doing a, a, a liver treatment and I'm doing a glutathione treatment at least once a month. So that's helped also. Uh, one supplement that I've taken consistently is R alpha lipoic acid. Um, that's something else that I've taken. I think it's just the combination of those things took my liver enzymes from a hundred down into in the thirties. 
So, um, I'm, I'm really happy with that. And I've had my liver enzymes checked multiple times now, and they're always in a good range. Um, so let's talk now about, um, I'm on TRT and my dose is not a big dose. It's a hundred, maybe 120, uh, milligrams, um, a week. And you guys know how I do that. I talk about my testosterone replacement therapy a lot. Um, so you guys know how I do that. And um, my blood work is really good. So there's a few things that I know that we want to watch on that. And we'll get to you were having me give blood because I had a few things high. So um, the first thing was my hemoglobin was over a little over 20 and now it's 16. So hemoglobin, do you think that's from uh, giving blood? Well, the hemoglobin increase actually is related to most of the time testosterone dosing. So when you get higher, you get um, uh, what we call erythrocytosis or increasing red cells. So I want to differentiate this to our, our, our crowd here that it's different from increasing all the cells in your blood. This is just red cells. And this is that effect of, of testosterone by itself when you're getting too much. And also, we're also using the parameter of hematocrit, not just hemoglobin. And the right. risk that we don't like to have here is when you have thicker blood, you actually have the higher possibility of, of cardiovascular uh, complications, heart, brain, uh, the, the legs, the, the hands. They're not getting enough circulation because it's so thick of a blood that it slowly moves through the blood vessels. Um, so that's why, again, this is usually seen in patients who are using intramuscular testosterone rather than uh, transdermal. And um, yeah, and they call this usually uh, therapeutic phlebotomy. Okay, so my hematocrit, and I should also say I, I live at 5,000 feet, which also can make a difference, right? Right. So with higher elevations, your, our blood uh, basically gets more red blood cells from the bone marrow because when you're in higher elevation, you need more oxygen. It's like you're getting squ uh, crunched up in a box and more oxygen is needed. And that's how the body compensates. Your bone marrow creates more red blood cells for you to breathe better or exchange oxygen with your cells. Okay, so my hematocrit went from over 55, the range is uh, 37 to 51. It went from over 55 down to under 50. So I'm down to 49. And that is also probably has something to do with giving blood. Is that correct? Right. So this actually is, I mean, I want you to perceive as um, therapeutic phlebotomy as not a permanent therapy for uh, this type of condition, which is your red blood cells being that high. It's really, the real treatment is adjusting that testosterone dose. But in this process of us adjusting that testosterone dose, we cannot have that risk of actually having you have thick blood. So during that whole process, as your body adjusts to it, we then um, do that specific intervention. So always lesson there is, it's gonna be the root cause, which is the higher dose of testosterone that you fix. And so you guys gotta know, I'm, I'm not, I, there's a lot of blood work. This is a full blood panel. I don't know. It's got to be 60, 70 different. You know, they, they took half my blood to do all these tests, I think. But um, so this is a lot of stuff. We're just going through a few of them because everything's good. Now, on the TRT, that dropped. We were all. My iron was high. It was 208, and my iron saturation was high. And so giving blood, uh, we, if we just talk about the iron for a minute, I'm looking at it. Um, iron, the, um, the normal range or whatever you want to call it is um, 38 to 169. That's a huge range. I was 208, so my iron was high. Mm -hmm. And then it dropped with the giving blood, it dropped to 42. 
So it's barely in the normal range because the normal range is 38 to 169, but my iron saturation is below the normal range. It's 12. It was 70 and it, that was high. The range 15 to uh, 55. So it was high. It was on the high end of the range ab above too high. And now it's too low. So, um, that's my iron saturation. So why don't you tell me again and our listeners what your advice is for um, what what your thoughts are on the giving blood and should I skip one or what, you know, what should I do? Well, Steve, in this situation, we have to understand first that fer ferritin or iron, um, how does it build up in the system, right? Because that's what you're, you have these moments that it was high on your end. So number one, it's an inflammatory marker. So this is something, if there's inflammation happening in your system, ferritin goes up. Another one would be excessive iron intake. So this is when you overdo uh, supplements, for example, or you're eating a lot of um, food-based iron and it's accumulating in your system. You're not excreting it. And there's also liver. a possibility. I'm sorry? Liver, right? Yes, liver. Yes, liver. Definitely, if you have liver impairment, it does uh, affect that. Another one is genetic. So there's a condition called hemochromatosis, meaning you have the predisposition to absorb more iron in your system compared to normal population. So in your situation, this is something that's still up in the air on why iron was high. But the bigger point here is, in your case, when you did therapeutic phlebotomy, you lowered all of these iron levels down because it's the, the main purpose. When you remove uh, RBCs, you also do that same process. You lower down the iron. So, and this that's why when I mentioned to you about before giving blood again, we're going to do another blood test for the reason that we do not want to plummet you down anymore in relation to lowering that iron level. Right now, we're still hypothesizing what uh, is the reason why it went down. and But from the looks of it, because this is the first time it happened to you, uh, we're, we're, it's probably because of that therapeutic phlebotomy that you did, but on, on our end, we're going to be more cautious. We're going to start you on some, um, not aggressive, but proactive iron supplementation if we need to. And then that blood test that we will do the next time around, will probably dictate and assess our intervention for you. But again, this is something that we see in therapeutic phlebotomy and nothing major here. Everything can be fixed. And that's why testosterone therapy needs to be done with your professional medical provider. And this is not something that you just play around with, especially when you're on TRT. Okay, so um, I noticed also here the UIBC is also in that iron category. It's in that same little, um, you know, columns that are kind of together. That was really low, mm -hmm. but that went up. It went opposite of iron. So UIBC, which I don't even know what that is, mm -hmm. the reference range is 111 to 343. I was 88 mm -hmm. when my iron was 208 and my iron saturation was 70, both high. My UIBC was too low. Right. Now my UIBC is in the normal range. It's 306. And... The, the reference range is 111 to 343. So what's that all? What do you think that's all about? So UIBC is unsaturated iron binding capacity. So this is actually uh, represents the portion of iron binding sites in we call transferrin that are not occupied by iron. So again, when you're when you have low um, iron levels, definitely you're not going to saturate these receptors. If you have high iron levels, then you have the ability to saturate these specific receptors. So it's a marker for us, again, in relation to how we assess the iron levels of a patient. It's not only we're not depending on total iron and ferritin, but we also consider these little proteins that carries iron around. Uh, but in general, your, your specific case here shows that you are currently depleted, uh, not in a bad way, but uh fixable and reversible which is basically the more important thing to understand 
Right, and my UIBC is in the normal range. So mm -hmm. it can happen. Um, yeah, let's talk about my testosterone. So, you know, it fluctuates, it depends. What I do is I usually wait like three days, three and a half days from my last injection to get my testosterone checked. Right. Now on this scale, um, the reference range is 264, which is pretty low, mm -hmm. up to 916. So um, I came in at 874.5. And this is one that, you know, everyone's different, but that's my total testosterone. And that's a good number, but you know, People can have symptoms of low testosterone anywhere in that range, right? Like if they, they may have symptoms of low testosterone and they might be at 450, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's true. So there's yeah. another thing where everyone's different. Everyone's different. So you need to right. talk to your doctor about that. But that's my, my total testosterone on that dose. And, you know, it, it fluctuates, but that's where it is. Any comments on that, doctor? Yeah, so when people assess their testosterone, they're thinking it's always about total testosterone. It's really all about free testosterone. Yeah. So when you're talking I about free testosterone, yeah, free testosterone is the one that's active, that actually can bind to receptors. Because total testosterone includes testosterone that is bound to protein, which is sometimes called a sex hormone binding globulin. And that is a useless type of testosterone. You cannot use that. So, I mean, it, as part of our um, medical, I guess, guidelines, we do have to look at total testosterone to achieve uh, eligibility for TRT for our patients. And that's why when we look at the ideal where you're at right now at the 800s, ideally at total testosterone levels of 500 to 800, this is where we want our patients to be. But you have to include the clinical symptoms of the patient. For the reason that when a patient is, let's say, 500, as you said, it's in that range, right? But if they're not feeling well, now you really have to look into, hey, what is the free testosterone of this patient? Are there more proteins bound to that testosterone? That's why it's ineffective. So it's not the end-all, be-all when you see your total testosterone. And you always have to remember, you need to combine that with your uh, clinical symptomatology. Okay, so my free testosterone um, is, okay, the range is 6 to 18, <clears throat> and I came in at about 13. That's my free testosterone. That's a good number, and I, you guys hear me say this a lot if you listen to the channel. I feel spectacular. I feel really good. I, I feel like a, someone in their 20s as far as just how my body works and moves and everything. So there's my free testosterone at about 13 um, with the range between six and 18. Your comments on that? Yeah, so with the free testosterone, I mean, we have different ways to calculate free testosterone, but you are landing on that, that mark where we want you to be in, uh, as you can see. And then that's why we, 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 you really have to advocate for that with your own doctors to check for free testosterone. So some of them who are, I mean, they're happy with that, with just getting total testosterone. Um, sometimes it gives them a false picture of the patient. Uh, and sometimes when they say that you don't need any more testosterone, I have patients who actually were total testosterones of uh, at least seven to 800. And when I checked their sex hormone binding globulin, it was super, super high, leaving free testosterone when you compute it being low. And, and that's the thing. So free testosterone really is your marker. And for, for you to understand it better, uh, just, just don't be deceived by total testosterone by itself. Okay, so and let's talk about pregnenolone. And again, this is, there's no you know, range for this, but... You um, subscribed for me some pregnenolone through one of the supplement companies that you use. And uh -huh. so I was taking that supplement. It was 48. You uh -huh. saw that as 15. Now, I know exactly what that is. I started taking it every other day or every third day. And 
it went from 48 down to 15. You wanted me to get back to, hey, take your pregnant alone every day. Give us some of the reasons why, because it went from 48 to 15. Mm -hmm. So 48 to 15. So that's definitely something that uh, can now be related to. So you have to remember, pregnant alone is the precursor of other hormones. It's, it's cortisol, it's uh, your testosterone, your estradiol, progesterone, it all goes down. It's, it's like a chain, chain algorithm, as you will see. So pregnant alone is something that also is not only a hormone precursor, but it also is something that's related to, for example, stress response. So stress response can affect that. It goes down most of the time when people go through acute or chronic stress. And another one would be a big correlation to that is brain function. So pregnenolone is just a very usable hormone for different types of system in, in, in our bodies. And in your situation, why we're working on this is because, of course, we want you to be at your optimal level. So meaning you're like one of our athletes. We want to maximize your performance. So uh, at 100 mark, we always want our pregnenolones that way. Uh, that's why we're kind of giving this supplement uh, to you. Uh, but you would notice that even with consistent intake of uh, pregnenolone in your situation, the bigger question here is, are you absorbing the oral pregnenolone? That's number one, right? Uh, number two, are we giving you too low of dose uh, of your pregnenolone? Or number three, did we catch your pregnenolone at, the, at, the bad, at a bad time during a blood test? Because I always tell patients that when you correlate preg uh, numbers in the blood test, you always correlate that with clinical symptoms. When I ask you about, hey, do you have any mind? Are you forgetting stuff? Are you burning your house down? You don't even know about it? No, you're pretty perfect. So that's why in this situation, I'm, I'm not really thinking that there's probably brain deterioration on your end. There's really a tragic effect when your pregnant alone is low like this. So how we ended with this is, we, I wanted you to continue your pregnant alone um, supplementation or maybe add a, even a little bit more to it. And also the more important thing here is reassessment through the blood test. But in my concern, it's not one of my priorities for you just because you're very optimum and even highly optimum with your functioning. So, but this is definitely good. And I work on this a lot with patients who forget so many things because it's a neurosteroid. It helps with their brain in terms of functioning. Okay. And I told you when we did this the first time, you can be happy now because all I did was I went back to the same dose that I was on before when it was 48. So okay. that should probably go right back to 48 because now uh, I'm not taking a lot, but it was one, I think maybe 30 milligrams a day. So I just take one of those again that's where it was when it was 48 so oh, okay being on the trt i know you like to look at the psa um my psa the range is four or less so i'm under one i've always been under one i've been as low as 0. 0.4 two three times in a row 0. 0.4 now for the last two times i've <coughs> been 0. 0.7 so I'm, I'm still under one. Um, it's 0.7. Now, look, I'm 61. I don't pee like a 12 year old, you know, it just, that, that's just not how it works. You know, I pee more like a 60 plus year old, not a 12 year old, but, um, my PSA is a, is a good number, right? Yes, yeah, Steve, with the PSA, it's something that we always check for with our TRT patients in relation to, oh, of course, the theory of testosterone stimulating the, the prostate to form prostate cancer. But there are theories out there now, such as, uh, I guess, depicted by Dr. Morgan Teller, that testosterone actually does not do that to the prostate. But again, following our medical guidelines, we always have to do um, um, prostate-specific antigens. And I want to emphasize to everybody that PSA is not only related to prostate cancer. I'm, I'm sorry, PSA is probably not a good parameter for you to gauge benign prostatic hypertrophy, meaning the, the aging growth of the prostate and causing urinary obstruction. So it's really more for assessing um, prostate cancer. So in this situation with you, uh, why we, we like it that way with your levels being like that it's not, you're not being overstimulated by testosterone 
to actually form uh, prostate cancer. And in order for us to understand if you are getting into that uh, picture, the, the level of greater than four is something that we look at. And when we see that when we're, uh, a patient is on TRT, we stop TRT and we let the patient, I guess, regroup or maybe redo a blood test. Sometimes if it's severe, very persistent, we need to refer to urology and only not that specific number we look out for, which is the greater than four, but there's also um, an entity called PSA velocity, meaning every year, if your PSA gets more than 0.5 or increasing like a stair ladder, then there's a higher suspicion of prostate cancer, thus needing further assessment. And, and that's why I wanna just correlate that. You, you, you brought up a big point. I'm not, yeah, I'm not peeing that bad. So I should probably not do my PSA numbers. So I wanna make sure that people understand that you still have to do that, even though the peeing is normal and you're not waking up at night and doing frequent stops. Okay, so estradiol, um, and that has to do with the sex binding, uh, sex hormone binding globule and the estradiol, the range is eight to 35. My estradiol was 30. Um, and, and that, that fluctuates from test to test. Mm -hmm. Um, I've noticed that my, um, what is it? Sex binding, sex hormone binding globule. When that's low, my free testosterone is higher. And that was kind of right in the middle of the range. And so is my estradiol. So um, it, it fluctuates, but um, 30, uh, you want it to be under 35. Um, I've also heard a lot of testosterone experts, hormone experts say you want it to be a certain percentage of what your total is and so on. So your thoughts on that? So with estrogen, this is something that we look at in relation to TRT for the reason that TR, uh, testosterone can be converted to estrogen by the aromatase enzyme. And when this happens, of course, when you become, when you're turning your testosterone into estrogen, you're not really f utilizing testosterone at its fullest. So meaning you're diverting it to away towards our objective here. And you will notice these patients, these are the ones who are complaining of fatigue, weight gain, uh, brain fog and create, having all these female characteristics like uh, women, like man boobs, um, crying at chick flicks. So these are things that you would see when you're not utilizing your testosterone properly. And one thing that's very, pretty important about creating more estrogen, which is more than 40, that's our cutoff, is this actually can be a culprit for prostate cancer. So when you have high estrogens, we don't like that. And we level that down back to 40 through natural ways like um, chrysin, uh, worst case scenario, an astrozole, a prescription. And when now the problem here is if you overdo it, if you put that estro estradiol so low, people think it's actually good. And you would see this in the gym world. There's a lot of people who likes their estrogen low, thinking that it's yeah. best for their testosterone levels, but it's not. You're going to break your right. bones. You're actually going to have low libido. You're going to have more cardiovascular risks, more strokes and heart attacks. So that's why keeping that sweet spot uh, in between 30 to 40 is best. So don't underestimate estradiol. Even as men, we need them as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, estrogen is very important too. Um, so now all kind of related to the hormones, um, DHEA. That went down a little bit. It's always been, the range is like 49 up to 344. Previously, I was at 95. Now I'm at 82. You said I could take a 25 milligrams of DHEA, a capsule, right? So I, I did get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Steve. So DHEA is something also, it's a precursor hormone. It's actually, again, before you're your um, testosterone before your estrogen turns to be it, it, it's DHEA first and it's released by your adrenal glands. And the thing here is when you look at DHEA, you don't only want to look at hormone levels. You always ask patients about their stress level because it actually is in co in coincidence with um, cortisol. So when your cortisol is high, DHEA helps you cope up with that stress and increases itself. 
So, and then it, it actually is kind of like the, the Robin to the Batman, right? And when DHEA is not optimal, you always want to reassess first on why it's not getting to that level. And in your situation, we, we, we attribute this, again, you're, you have optimal levels, and, but still we want it to be, again, at the best number that it can be. So men can actually start with around 25, 50. Sure, I have some 100, but they, they do get more DHEA and they need DHEA more than women because DHEA turns into testosterone. So if you're like just wanting to tweak that testosterone level, DHEA is probably a way to, uh, the way to go. But your DHEA, is, this is just more of really tweaking. Okay, just a couple more here. Now the ferritin, um, also that was... Um, that was a little low. I thought I only had one, but I have two that were a little low. The ferritin, which is also has to do with the iron. Mm -hmm. I was 75 before, but d giving the blood, um, it, the range is 30 to 400. I'm at 22. And that's also related to most likely giving blood, right? That's correct. And last thing here is the sex hormone binding globule, which also is going to be affected by the TRT. The normal range is 19 to 76. Um, previously, I was at uh, 29. I'm at 32 now. I've noticed when the sex hormone binding globule is lower, my free testosterone is higher. So I'm in a good range, but I'm at the lower end of the scale, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So with uh, so sex hormone, yeah, with sex hormone binding globulin, again, it's a protein made mostly by your liver. It attaches to, of course, these hormones that we're talking about. So the more uh, sex hormone binding globulin you have, the less effectivity for your hormones. So if you want this down, uh, I mean, not totally zero it out, but we want this again at the optimal level. And you would notice this being higher. You don't like higher because it's gonna, it's basically inversely proportional with the hormone um, effectivity. So you want this uh, again, um, just in the sweet spot because when it's higher, it always comes with, for example, inflammation, like um, obesity, um, type two diabetes, uh, high cholesterol. So it's also a marker for you to notice that, hey, there's probably something else going on with this person. And I see this a lot in females who are actually taking a lot of contraception, uh, oral contraception. Uh, so these synthetic hormones alter your sex hormone binding globulin in a bad way. And that's why we use boron for that. So in order for us to lower the SH, SHBG, boron now frees up all these hormones to be used again by your body. Wow. Well, um... That, I mean, there's a lot that there's a lot more on on here, but that kind of just relates to directly to me and the things that have really affected it. And uh, you know, we we do this interview once a week, and we I get you know, I'm I'm blessed enough, I guess you can say, to be able to talk to you about little things, personal things, you know, before we do our interview every week. But there's another fifty or sixty tests on here, which are basically all good. Some of them are a little, went up a little, some went down a little bit. They're all in the normal range. And that's another 50 or 60 tests. And uh, again, at my age, uh, I mean, I think I'm making my doctor pretty happy, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah. To, for the viewers, Steve didn't pay me anything for me to praise his blood work. This is all real and he's doing A-OK. -okay. It's like, what do you want, man? <laughs> <laughs> if most of my patients are like you, hey, we, we won't have any problems. The ideal blood work for the ideal patient. If everybody could be like him, hey, it'd be good, right? Yeah, everyone would be a teenager. All right. Well, as always, thanks for being with us, Dr. Nario. You can check him out online at Biointegrative Health Center in Reno, Nevada, and see the different treatments and things that, that they do there. So thanks for being with us. Well, thank you, Steve, for having me again. As we all know, knowledge is power. And thank you for letting me provide you with edge, edge and longevity and health maintenance, which I call the biological edge or the bio edge.